Scrum. And we all know that Scrum really had done a lot of good things um, to us yeah. and has a lot of good ideas. But there's also some short shortcomings. Um, mm -hmm. e even if we appreciate all the stuff that yeah. that's good there, but there are some shortcomings. Could you mention some? Sort of yeah, and, and maybe, I mean, j j just step up, step back to the issue of what is the good DNA in Scrum exactly. compared to Waterfall and things like that. I mean, Scrum essentially got, Waterfall uses maximum theoretical batch size mm -hmm. in that, you know, you define 100% of requirements before you begin design. And you cannot make batch size any higher than 100% and when you use maximum theoretical batch size, you get maximum theoretical cycle time. Yeah. So, so the waterfall model is a disaster with regard to cycle time. Mm -hmm. And Scrum really made massive reductions in batch size. Now, it didn't use the vocabulary batch size. It used sprints and things like that. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it operationally, what was happening was that batch sizes were being reduced all over the place. The, mm -hmm. the quantity of work you took for a sprint went down. The, when you did retrospectives at the end of the sprint, you would extract learning from a project in small batches instead of waiting till the end of the project mm -hmm. to do. You would do detailed planning at a short time horizon instead of producing a detailed plan out 18 months into the future. So it solved very many of the problems associated with waterfall. Mm -hmm. um, it uses cadence, which is a, is a, a superb way of preventing the buildup of variance. And so there's lots of good DNA in Scrum. There's a lot of good DNA in the Kanban system that we see being used, and there's a lot of shared DNA between the mm -hmm. two of them. And, and, I, and you I'm, know Kanban very well because you're friends with David Anderson, yeah, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, and, and in fact, David asked me to write the forward for his book right. Kanban and, and things like that. So yeah. I, I usually I won't write a forward until I've read the book. <laughs> good, good idea. And I like the book. That, that's and, good. And good I do. I very much like David's work, yeah. but. You know, the interesting thing, most people ask me, well, when would I use this methodology versus that methodology? And I've never been a fan of methodologies. Okay. I, I like the methods that are being used in the methodology, okay. the but I, I don't like yeah. the, this, this system that says, you got to do all 14 things to go to heaven. You know, you, no admission to heaven unless you do all 14 things. And I think it's, it's interesting to see I mean, just what some of the upside associated with Scrum is. Because, you know, when we were comparing the batch size of Waterfall with the batch size of Scrum, uh, it was a huge reduction in batch size. Definitely, yeah. But what you're seeing today is a lot of people saying the batch size of Scrum is too large for what we want to achieve operationally. Okay. Uh, so. You know, you, you see people like Facebook who are specifying features, coding features, testing features, and deploying them live on the web in less than 24 hours. Mm -hmm. You don't do that with a two-week sprint. You can't. And I, I think you're seeing a lot of Scrum practitioners, whether it is sanctioned or not, what has happened is initially they had very low transaction cost in coding, which allowed them to use small batch sizes in coding but they had high transaction costs in deployment. So they still had to deploy in large batches. And that was compatible with completing all your stories and delivering them at the end of the sprint. Yeah. Now the deployment costs have dropped dramatically because we're using the same type of automation in our deployment flows and things. So now we actually can deploy in small batches. And what you're seeing a lot of people using Scrum doing, and I don't know whether this is legal or not according <laughs> to the Scrum purists, but what they're doing is they're saying, look, if we have the ability to deploy a story three days into the sprint because our downstream process can take it, why should we hold that back and not get the economic value of deploying that story? Right away. And I, I heard the general manager of Microsoft Xbox division talking uh, at uh, actually at a Lean Kanban conference 
uh, about a year ago or so. And he was saying how they were using Scrum for a long time in the software, but they ultimately said, we need to deploy code every 24 hours. Mm -hmm. we, we want to be pushing code every 24 hours to our network. We want to reduce the latency time between when we find an issue and when we put a solution or put a capability up on the web. And they said, we cannot do that using two-week sprints. Mm -hmm. So they shifted to a Kanban approach. And what, what you'd recognize about a Kanban approach is that Essentially, in Kanban, if you have a whip constraint, think of it as I can only have a certain number of stories in flight, is that every time I complete a story, I create an opportunity to start another story. So instead of being able to start stories once every two weeks, you are starting stories every day. Mm -hmm. And, and if, if you can put a story into flight every day, if you have something that needs to be done quickly, you can put it into flight and land it mm -hmm. a lot shorter than a two week period. Yeah. So, so I think, and, and there's nothing intrinsic about, uh, about Scrum that prevents you from moving in that direction, but, but I think there is a lot of interesting upside. It, it's not, you know, I, I think people who would say, throw out Scrum, there's a new methodology to be used and things like that are making a big mistake because you'd be throwing out a lot of great stuff. But, I think the people whose view of the world is Scrum is perfect the way it is today, mm -hmm. and anybody who suggests changing it is an infidel, um, I, yeah. I think that's also the wrong answer. I tend to say first adopt it, then adapt it. So you should yeah. understand it, and then, I mean, the point is the way to go, so to find out how to change it, but yeah. only if you and, understand and, and it. And my observation working with engineers for the last 30 years and things like that is that whenever a company uses a methodology, there will also be an underground process where they do what makes sense independent of what the methodology tells them to do. That's because true. Engineers are basically practical enough and sensible enough to say, uh, I'm gonna pay attention to what is working. Whether, whether I'm allowed to do it or not, uh, I will probably still end up doing things in a sensible way. Yeah, that's true.